display default is to actually show the time of day. That's the display default. We've just re restarted this one, so it's actually showing the set point temperature. So this unit's set for 116 degrees. From the factory, we can go to as low as 100 degrees or to a maximum of 120 degrees set point. And again, it's maxed at 120. Many states have gone to a maximum of 120 degrees as a mandate. Uh, these products are available in Canada. The entire country has gone to that. So we looked at that 120 maximum as a practical number. I'll show you in a little bit exactly how you can increase that. You can increase that up to a maximum of 140 degrees, but from the factory, 100 to 120, and as you see, it's two degree increments, not five degree increments. And it is a touch screen. So what else does this touch screen give us? It gives us a ton of information, an absolute ton of information, and a bunch of capabilities that are just absolutely amazing as we look at it. All we have to do to see all of these capabilities is just push this back arrow. And all of these icons, I think, are pretty well recognized. Obviously, that's our power button. That's what's going to turn the unit on and off. That's OK button, just means accept, enter. Back button is to return. And then we got the carrots to scroll either through the menu or through the set point temperature. But for now, we're just going to hit the back arrow. And the first place it takes us is to this category called P4 information. How do we access P4 information. We can hit this, scroll these arrows, and they just roll around and come back to information. So how do you see what's in information? Well, we know it's not the scroll button. No, it's not the back button. OK button. So now we're into, the, we're into information. And in information, we have something called data history, something called operational data, something called failures history, something called consumption, something called about, and something called data history. So it loops around, brought, brought us back to that same point again. So what, what do we see in here? We want to see what's inside data history? We press OK. This is a relatively young unit. It has fired a total of 15 times. So we can see the operation cycles is 15 and run for a total of 28 minutes. No further data there. Back arrow gets us out. Scroll down to operational data, and we're going to hit OK. Operational data, first page of operational data talks about the heat exchanger, the inlet NTC, and the outlet NTC. So the heat exchanger is where we are actually seeing that hottest temperature of the water, the, where the, that temperature is being managed by the active bypass valve. Inlet NTC is the temperature of the water coming in. Outlet NTC is what's actually being delivered out into the plumbing. So that's the first page. There's more pages. We can scroll through here. And we have a, a page that shows fan speed water flow, gallons per minute, how much water is actually moving through the unit, and then the output power, rough percent of output power. Scrolling down again, now we see all of those air and exhaust NTCs, so that would be the ambient air temperature, the temperature of the flue gases leaving the combustion chamber, and then the actual stack limiter NTC up at the top. Tank temperature, so these actually have the ability to do tank loading, tank loading being the idea that this is a sidearm to a storage tank. With an NTC, we can actually look at that temperature on the tank the barometric pressure, and then the ionization current, which is all zero because the unit's not operating. Then that scrolls us back around to the water temperature NTCs. So if we jump out of there, we scroll down to operational data, we can then go down to failure histories. Now, failure history sounds like a bad thing, but it's not necessarily a terrible thing. Um, we can hit OK here. And here's why I suggest to anyone who's installing one of these units, even if you're not doing domestic recirculation, set up the clock and set up the calendar on this unit. And why do I say that? Because right here, if I hit OK, it's going to show us what A8. A8 um, is the most recent error code. If we hit OK, it shows us this, this A8 occurred on April 7th at 8.39 in the morning. And that's typically very, very valuable information in troubleshooting. So uh, very recommended to set up that calendar. And then the failure histories actually stores the 10 most recent error codes that the unit has produced. Consumptions just talks about how much water, fuel, and the total runtime of the unit. So the unit over the past three operations, five, I'm sorry, five operations has used 46.4 gallons of water. 21,460 BTUs of gas and run for a total of 13 minutes. Again, this is a very, very new, new unit in this lab situation. HS is software information. This just tells you the version of software that the unit is running on. And then we're back to data history. 
P9 just forces the unit into purge, and SA is settings. So in settings, again, this is where we could set the clock, and I think it's fairly, fairly easily understood clock, and then if we hit OK on that, it's going to give you the carrots on the hour, change the hour, change the minutes, change the AM, PM. Scrolling down, we can go to date, and it's the same exact configuration there. With this date set up, we don't really need to set it up again, it's all good. Recirculation, this is where we can set up domestic recirculation. Now, the logic on this, and why do we want the unit to control domestic recirculation? How does it make sense, or why does it make sense for the unit to control domestic recirculation? Two primary drivers why we want the unit controlling domestic recirculation. One, better energy savings. Two, better durability. The unit will run longer, last longer, with the unit controlling recirculation. And why is that? If we set up domestic recirculation, on a timer where it's, on, where it's on for any given amount of time. The unit's trying to fire for that entire amount of time. So it's trying to manage temperature the, the entire time. If we set it up on constant recirc, uh, you know, no, no timer, un, just completely uncontrolled recirculation, so we're using then a lot of energy and the unit's being active a lot. And keep in mind, the domestic recirculation loop is really nothing more than a radiant loop. We're just dumping BTUs into the house to keep the water warm. The logic for this unit on domestic recirculation, and this includes a T9800 series running an external circulator or the T9900 series running the internal circulator, the logic goes like this. Time of day the recirculation starts, and there could be multiple periods per day that the recirculation's on, then off, then on again, but the logic is this. Recirculation starts at a given time. Every half hour can start, or half hour increments. So we're gonna say domestic recirculation is gonna start at five in the morning, because people are waking up, getting ready to go. It's gonna start at five in the morning, and it's gonna run till 7.30 in the morning. So at 5.30, the unit powers the circulator. Again, doesn't matter if it's an internal or external circulator, the unit powers the circulator. The circulator causes water to move through the unit, Water moves through the unit, the unit fires. It starts to make hot water. Now in domestic recirculation, keep in mind, we're going out to the furthest point in the house and then bringing the water back. And it doesn't matter whether we're bringing the water back via a dedicated recirc line or via a crossover and coming back on the cold water line, water's coming back to the unit. As it's coming back to the unit, eventually it starts to get warm coming back to the unit. So the inlet temperature sensor sees the inlet temperature climbing. The board, the ECU, knows, and that's OptiFlow, the combustion management system's watching all of this stuff. OptiFlow is watching that and says, okay, I logically know that I'm running the circulator, and I also logically know that hot water's coming into the unit. So that can tell the unit that obviously, okay, we have, we've satisfied the loop. It's hot already. So when it comes back, when the water comes back within 10 degrees of set point, it then shuts off the circulator. It leaves the circulator off for 15 minutes, and then brings it back on, again testing that loop until the water comes back within 10 degrees of set point. If somebody wants to go and increase comfort, we can actually bring that down to as small as five degrees of set point or out to as much as 20 degrees of set point, depending on the level of comfort or the length of the run or whatever the different parameters we might want to adjust that. So the OptiFlow combustion management system allows that recirculation. And again, programming recirculation, uh, we can do, uh, a schedule, and on the schedule, we'll see that we have day of the week, what day of the week do we want, and then we can schedule every day the same, we can schedule every day different, we can schedule some days the same, other days different, however we want to do it to optimize that comfort in the home. So that's the idea of domestic recirculation and, and how it's going to work. We can also do tank loading recirculation. We can't do them both at the same time, but we can... Um, to tank loading recirculation as well. And again, that's controlled by that same logic that says when the water's coming back in hot, it's gonna shut that circulator off. Language, so language is a kind of a critical one, right? In, in America, we have a lot of people speaking a lot of different languages. This unit will display in seven distinct languages. The default for North America is English. It will also display in Spanish, it'll display in French. It'll display in Portuguese, which might seem like an odd one until you understand that our factory is actually in Portugal, so that makes Portuguese make sense. It'll display in German, which I think makes sense. Bosch is a German company after all. It'll display in Italian, and then strikingly, it'll actually display in Chinese. So those are the seven languages that we have the ability to display through this unit. 
wireless connectivity. So if you want that Wi-Fi, whether it's the option on the 9800s or whether it's built in on the 99i model, Wi-Fi setup is where you set up the Wi-Fi. Startup delay uh, actually allows, if you're feeding this some kind of preheated water for some reason, it actually allows the unit to ignore flow for a certain amount of time in order to manage that idea that the water's coming in hot already. We can actually, if somebody really needs metric, if you really prefer metric over, over imperial, you can actually change the units to metric. In the display timeout, how long does it stay lit before it goes dark? Because it, it does go, it dims, it doesn't shut off, it just dims. And then we're back to setting the clock and the date. So those are all things that a homeowner can see. None of that's password protected. That's fully active for a contractor to look at, for a homeowner to look at. Anyone can look at that data. And it's mostly read-only data. There's not a whole lot you can do there aside from changing the schedule. That's one of the things that you can do, obviously, is change the schedule on the recirculation. But that's one of the, one of the few things that we can actually do through that display. We're going to get a little bit more in depth and talk about some of the service points when we get inside of there. And now we're going to start to talk about password protected areas of, of the software of the OptiFlow combustion management system, uh, which obviously that's housed on that control unit on the, on the ECU. So we talked about efficiency, we talked about thermal efficiency, we talked about combustion efficiency, we talked about the advantages on installation, the top connections, the built in service ports, and the ability for the unit to set itself up for combustion. So let's take a look at that. And again, that's going to be in a password protected area. We don't really want a homeowner going in and messing with that. We really want to keep this guarded to, to professionals, to contractors. So to access that, again, we go into programming. Then we go to something we haven't looked at, which is called AU, technical settings. Accessing technical settings, we're going to hit OK. And we're going to enter a password. This password is 188. Six. 1886. Why 1886? That was the year Robert Bosch first founded the company. So Robert, the Robert Bosch LLC was founded in 1886. Funny thing about tankless water heaters, we actually own a patent which was written by Hugo Junkers for a tankless water heater that was developed in 1896. So Bosch has been doing this tankless water heating thing for a very long time. So now when we hit this back arrow, we have more menus that are open up. And one of them is combustion auto adjust, UC. So now this is going to take, we're going to have to have water flowing through the unit. And this is about a 15 minute process, but we're just going to take a look at what's happening here as this process goes on. So we're going to open up some taps here. We're going to hit OK. Please wait. If you can hear, the fan has actually started. The fan started and the unit's running. And we're on step one of eight on combustion auto adjust. Eventually, we're going to get a message that says open taps. The open taps message indicates that there's not enough water moving through the unit for it to actually begin to fire. So we're just going to get that open taps message. We'll bring this tap open here. Okay, so that's combustion auto adjust. Uh, other things that we can see inside of this password protected area, which are very, very important, scrolling down a little bit, is gas type. So if we're going to change the fuel type, this unit has actually already been changed to LP, but to change the fuel type, we press OK. And then it gives you the option of LP gas or natural gas. So obviously, these only ship as natural gas. They're field convertible. You cannot order an, an LP version of this product. You're going to field convert it. And let me show you, the process takes at most 10 minutes. So we're going to go in and change it to LP gas. We're going to hit OK. So we're in there. Then there's a physical conversion process, which happens inside of the cabinet. And I'm not going to take this one apart, but it's one, two, three, four screws here. These are number 25 torques. This cover comes off. Behind there's a gasket. The gasket gets replaced by a gasket that clips in and holds in a series of three orifices, one for each of the segments, segment one, segment two, and segment three. So there's three orifices which slide in place. Then that new gasket with the brackets and the orifices gets slid back in place. The four screws get tightened down, and now the unit's converted. We would then run the combustion auto adjust at that point in time for a new unit. So that's fuel type. You can also look at cascading, setting up the cascading, uh, which we don't have the cascade capability right now. And temperature limited. So we said from the factory, this unit goes from 100 to 120 degrees. Under temperature limited, we hit OK. And now we'll see that we can unlock it. And when we unlock it, the carrots appear on the, on the temperature. And we can say, 
Let's imagine our installation here was actually at a daycare or something like that, or maybe a senior center. We're going to lock in our temperature at 110 degrees, so now nobody can get hurt. Okay. So now as we back out, what we'll see is our temperature maximum drops to 110 degrees, and we can't go above 110 degrees. So from a safety feature, that can become very, very important in certain settings. That is something that we can very easily undo. It doesn't have to stay that way. So now let's go temperature limited and let's take it the other way. Let's take it to a higher temperature. So the carrots appear when we hit OK. And maybe this one's installed with one of the Bosch hydronic air handlers. So we're going to do a little space heating with hot water through, it, through a coil. So we, now we need that higher temperature. So we go to 130 degrees and say OK. But now see what happens is it still stays at 110. It doesn't jump to the maximum. It stays at the previous setting. But now we do have the ability to scroll up and scroll all the way up to 130 degrees. So that's temperature limited. That's the feature of temperature limited, where we can lock the temperature to different points, higher or lower, but anywhere between that 100 and 140 degree maximum. We can also see if for some reason the rating plate has become destroyed and you're not sure what product you're looking at, you can go in and see the appliance type. You can see the BTUs and all of that other kind of data inside of the unit. For long-term serviceability, uh, we can actually go in and look at the settings for minimum power, maximum power, uh, which is basically what happens in auto-tuning, but you can force that to happen manually. If you want to do that, um, you can adjust the recirculation settings as well. So there's a bunch of other features, but the primary ones are the ones we looked at that's inside of that capability. So conversion, very, very easy. Four screws and a setting on the display. Very, very easy to do that conversion and very, very fast, very reliable to do that conversion.